When the Western Front became a stalemate in 1914, the Allies began looking for new places further and further afield to try and break through. From Gallipoli to Palestine to the Tigris River, they'd had high hopes, but to no avail. And more high hopes come crashing down this week as Russian, French, British, Italian and Serbian forces, the Five Nation Army, fail in Macedonia. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to The Great War. Last week, French Army Chief of Staff Robert Nivelle was fired because of French disasters in the field and replaced by Philippe Pétain. The British ended the week with a huge disaster of their own in the field, but prepared for more attacks. The Russians, their army crippled by desertions and mutinous behavior, still vow to continue the war. Indeed, the war continued everywhere, and one such place was the Macedonian Front. The Allied plan this week against the Bulgarians and Germans was for the Italians and French with a Russian infantry brigade to attack at Cherna Ben. The Serbs would attack in their sector and the British would attack east of the Vardar. In fact, General Maurice Sarail, in overall command, planned a frontal assault on the whole length of the enemy lines by the French and Italians, which his commanders were pretty skeptical about. I mean, We've seen before how daunting the Bulgarian defensive system was, possibly the best on any front, and they had the heights, with dozens of searchlights blazing down on the Allies in battle. They were also backed by German heavy artillery and Austrian howitzers. Still, on the 5th, 91 French and Italian artillery batteries opened up on the enemy. The bombardment lasted for four days, but did not significantly damage the enemy's defenses. At 6.30 a.m. on May 9th, the French, Italian, and Russian infantry attacked. It was a failure. During the assault, the Bulgarians took just under 700 casualties. Add the thousand or so they'd taken in the barrage, and that's 1,700-ish. Now, I don't know the German figures there, but they may be a bit higher since they were in the thick of the fighting, but the Allies took 5,450 casualties and gained absolutely nothing. Sarail was not deterred by this and tried another attack the 11th. It too was a failure. The second Serbian army went into action the 9th and that attack stalled after taking its first few objectives. But then the Serbs were stuck under a withering counter artillery attack. French and British big guns helped out a bit, but they couldn't get much further. As for the British attack, that was the renewal of the Battle of Doiron, which began a couple of weeks ago. The British launched an artillery barrage and then an assault on the evening of the 8th. But by the following day, they were forced to abandon the attacks because of heavy casualties. Fog and smoke caused confusion. Telephone lines were cut by shell fire. Their infantry were hit by their own artillery. It was a mess of confusion. Since the battle began in April, they had lost over 12,000 men killed, wounded, or captured, while Vladimir Vasov's Bulgarians had lost just one-sixth of that, and half of those from disease, not battle. As for the first Serbian army, Sarail asked for action and got delayed. They said that until the heights had fallen to the second army, the first was too vulnerable. Then the Serbs asked Sarail to stop the whole campaign. All of these defeats and lack of progress, combined with the French failure to advance at Monastir, meant that for the course of the whole spring offensive, the Allies had lost tens of thousands of men in total and had taken basically nothing. There would be another attack next week on the Struma River, and the Irish division there would take its objectives after barely firing a shot, but Sarail would call off the entire offensive, having achieved nothing except turning living men into dead ones. Of course, this was overshadowed by the recent colossal French failure at the Chemin de Dom, so he didn't have to worry about his job at this point. The French were actually attacking again on the Western Front this week. That attack had begun the night of the 4th, continued on the 5th, and managed to take Creon and the edge of the California Plateau, but could not cross the Alette River. Another attack a few days later took Vauclair and La Faux Mill. Actually, on the 5th, the attacks were in cooperation with the British, and they took the crest of the Crayon Ridge and 6,000 prisoners. And further north, the British were trying again at Bulcourt, as they had last week. First, they held off a German counterattack on the 6th, then mounted their own attack on the 7th, gaining a foothold in the ruins of the village. Over the next few days, they were shelled continuously and attacked with flamethrowers, and though the battle wouldn't officially end until next week, it was 
for all intents and purposes, over. The British had taken tens of thousands of casualties for a minute portion of the Hindenburg Line. By this time, General Edmund Allenby, commanding the Third Army, was warning Commander-in-Chief Sir Douglas Haig that the reserves, now being sent into battle, were semi-trained troops, unable to use their rifles properly. Also at this point, twice as many British as Germans were being killed in the offensives. The British were up to 4,000 casualties per day. So on the 10th, in the House of Commons, Winston Churchill, pointing out that American troops wouldn't be ready until next year, said, is it not obvious that we ought not to squander the remaining armies of France and Britain in precipitate offensives before the American power begins to be felt on the battlefield? He received no answer. There would be more offensives. Prime Minister David Lloyd George, unlike the military, saw no reason to attempt offensives before the Americans arrived. And he pushed for a new Italian offensive. He was really putting a lot of faith in the importance of the American army. I mean, when the US declared war, for a while, it wasn't even certain they would send any men and would send only supplies and money. Congress did pass a bill last week to raise 500,000 men, but the US army didn't even have divisions. Its biggest unit was the regiment. So the US began putting together a first division to dispatch to France, even though it hadn't been trained for combat and was too small to make a difference. It and the rest of the American Expeditionary Force would, from May 10th, be under the command of General John J. Pershing. Seeing as how I've mentioned the Italian front, I will look there for a moment. It's been quiet for pretty much the last six months, but that's about to change. Now, both sides had really built up their forces over the winter. The Italian forces had nearly doubled, and their artillery was up to 2,200 big guns, including British and French heavy pieces. On the other side, Austro-Hungarian commander Svetosar Barojevich von Boynja was still way outnumbered, but he too beefed up his numbers and now had 1,400 big guns. As usual, his engineers had been busy rebuilding fortifications and protecting machine gun posts, fortifying trenches and shelters, and building additional defensive lines. The Italians would soon attack, and the plan was straightforward. The 10th Battle of the Asanzo would be in two flanks. First, the army of Gorizia would attack on the northern flank, trying to break through to the Bayensitsa Plateau. Italian Army Chief of Staff Luigi Cadorna hoped that this would lead Borojevic to move men to the north, and then the Italian Third Army would attack to the south, across the Carso Plateau towards Trieste. Borojevic's problem was that he didn't know when the Italians would attack, since they were now much better at camouflage and hiding their movements. The attack was set for the beginning of May, but heavy rains delayed it again and again. It would happen soon. And something interesting happened in early May at sea. A convoy of merchant ships guarded by destroyers sailed from Gibraltar to Britain without a single loss to a German submarine. The convoy system had been dismissed earlier as useless, but after this the British Admiralty began looking into it seriously. They had to do something, having lost nearly 900,000 tons of shipping in April alone, 50% more than what Germany believed was needed monthly to drive Britain out of the war. And that's the end of the week. The Allies unable to break through in Macedonia, the Allies unable to break through in the West, and the Allies planning for a breakthrough in northern Italy. Well, at least they're still planning for one somewhere. It's hard to know just what the generals in the West were thinking about the Macedonian front, but I know that it was a side note or a footnote to many of them. It couldn't be that hard. I mean, the Bulgarians? Can they fight the five-nation army? How many times do we see this? The smaller or lesser nations that are supposed to be easy pickings and never are? Remember when the Germans were joking about just sending the police to arrest the British army back in 1914? Yeah, they don't do that anymore. See, it turns out every nation can learn to be great at modern war. If you'd like to learn more about the excellent Bulgarian defenses, you can check out our weekly episode from February right here. Our Patreon supporter of the week is April Joy Grybrock. Help us out on Patreon to make this show better and better. And do not forget to subscribe. See you next time.